Hey everybody, it's the Oregon's Lone Wolf here, out here in beautiful Oregon. And I thought I'd talk to you about a little project that I had, uh, that I've been working on, and I'm uh, pretty happy that I got it done. This is the first project I've ever done, uh, first swap I've ever done. So although I'm not an expert, I've done it once, and I know a little bit about uh, how the process works, and I thought I'd share it with you. So many of the videos online show the engine starting, and well, that's cool. But it doesn't actually go through a video process on what is needed to go ahead and make this uh, transition a success. Little quick story: that big old ugly 3.0 over here, uh, I hydro locked. I was out for buying, and well, I could have swore that puddle was only a foot deep. It turned out to be <laughs> much deeper. But in the process, I had done an air box mod, which would have been over on this side, drilled hole, holes in the bottom to get better airflow. And although it did give me a significant amount of power, uh, I forgot that when I splashed through the water and sucked water in. So anyway, back to the 3.4 swap. This is a 97 engine, uh, bought it on eBay, shipped out really nicely, no problem. Uh, came packaged very well, as you'll see in this picture. Anyway, there are little things I want to talk to you about, about what's needed to swap over from the 3.0 over to the 3.4 in order to make this to work. First and foremost, you have your engine. You're going to need your mounting brackets off of the engine itself. These will directly mount to the mounts that are inside your truck on the um, frame there. Second of all, uh, you're going to need your oil pan. So if you have an independent front suspension in a 3.0, you're going to need to go ahead and pull off that oil pan and slap it onto this engine. No big deal. Uh, the other thing you're going to need are, is an alternator. So what I opted to use is just the standard 3.0 that came off of my old engine. It was running fine and, and uh, just that, decided to keep that. I'm sure I have a couple thousand miles left on that, if not tens of thousands. Anyway, so let's talk about the alternator, why I'm here. Uh, this mounts up pretty fairly easy. One thing you want to keep in mind is there's going to be a distance between the alternator and your steering shaft right here that you want to be careful of. As this bounces around, it could make contact. But as you can see, I have a good you know, half inch back between there. No big deal. Uh, regarding your mounting bracket on the bottom, you're going to need your mounting bracket for the 3.4. But what you're going to need to do is put four washers back between the bracket and the actual engine block itself. So it'll set it back a little bit from the block so this will mount up perfectly fine. Uh, the other thing <coughs> you're going to need when you put this together is a power steering pump from a 3.4. Now I bought this online, uh, found on eBay. When buying on eBay, keep in mind that you want to buy products that have like a 30 day warranty on them. Uh, I made that mistake in buying some things and I'm out 80 bucks because of that. So anyway, when you get your power steering pump, make sure it also comes the lower bracket lower bracket on mine did not come with it if you happen to get a 3.4 chances are it won't so keep that in mind to also get your lower bracket mounting bracket the other thing you're going to need for your 3.4 power steering pump is going to be a high pressure line because the unions on the 3.4 and the 3.0 uh, down there really won't match up so what i opted to do is get a high pressure hose from off-road solutions Yes, it was kind of spendy, but it's kind of needed in the process. Uh, the other thing you're going to need is the EVAP from your 3.4. Or you can modify your 3.0, which would be over on this side. But I opted to keep everything uh, compatible uh, for the 3.4, not that the other one would not work. Uh, most common question that is put out there on the forums is, how do you hook these things up? So I thought I'd give you a little... little explanation on how that's done anyway this tube right here it's gonna be your vent hose it's gonna come all the way down here and just be a dump so wherever that goes it just goes it's not gonna flap into anything you can attach it which is something I'm gonna do here with a clamp but anyway that's your vent hose that goes down there the second hose over here goes right over here along the top of the engine to your air intake just after the air filter your other one that's most important our secondary motor is the top one over here. I can't remember what that's called. That's a VSV, I believe. Comes over here and hooks up to your 
top line vacuum line on your air intake lastly and uh, most important as you can see this little vacuum hose right here there's a little line up underneath it this one mounts or routes over to the back of your bay and hooks up right here to your exhaust line I'm sorry your um, your fuel vent which is going to be this little doohickey right here okay hang on as we go right over here we're going to talk about your air I'm sorry your, your coolant reservoir coolant reservoir normally was positioned like this uh, because we had to move the battery from this side over to this side which is what we'll talk about in a second you also had to mount your coolant reservoir just next to it like that I simply you know found a little spot and made it work works fine I'll run it off there okay let's talk about the battery now remember the battery used to be located over on this section of the engine but since we had to move the air intake from over here over to this side of course we had to move the battery so what I did here is I took a four gauge wire and put it in the connectors and let's talk about the connectors a little bit when you're using the larger gauge wire you need to of course attach them to them and I found the best way to do that is just get some electrical solder pack it on the inside of the connector heat it up with a propane torch melt it on down add a little bit more melt it on down and then take your four gauge wire or two gauge or whatever you're using and slam it down into the connector uh, let it dry and then take some shrink wrap and uh, complete the connection and in this case I made it look clean by putting some cable connectors on there so after you have that done you want to connect it to a 120 amp fuse then you run it all the way back down here and it cruises down there all nice and hidden and it goes over to your fuse box now your fuse box used to be mounted like this of course we had to move it like this so it gets out of the way of your air intake some of them have a little ear that comes off of the back and can connect if you have that you're lucky cool if not what I found is the old bracket that used to be used for the fuse box has an angle that is the perfect angle that matches the wheel well you just find that little section uh, cut it off and you're gonna have a, a mount screw on that and it mounts perfectly to the wheel well uh, angle and it also is going to connect to your uh, <clears throat> to your fuse box up here okay back to the wire this four gauge wire goes inside your fuse box it's going to hook up to your 80 amp fuse uh, when you take it apart you're going to notice a little flat square piece uh, that the old wire used to connect to just go ahead and snip off that wire all right uh, put an eye connector on your wire here and uh, just um, take off one of the screws that connects uh, those uh, that uh, square piece to and um, put it there and that way uh, the power of that is going to power both of those sections using that flat square piece okay let's cruise back over here and let's talk about some other wires here on my negative ground what I used was and I probably have these wrong I do have them wrong but oh well anyway uh, what you have over here is I used an 8 gauge ground wire a lot of times the old batteries or the original battery cables that come for it have a little wire that comes off that I don't know what gauge it is 10 something I don't know anyway it's kind of small so I, I beefed it up a little bit made it a uh, stuck it on the firewall there um, so this is a good thing to think about the other thing I used instead of the regular starter wire uh, I'm sorry the uh, the original ground wire is going to be the old starter wire from my 3.0 which I believe is going to be a, a two gauge or something like that um, and I use that for my ground uh, as it's just going to be a thicker connection to that uh, block itself um, now the other thing I want to talk about that I think I skipped is going to be the manual transmission or the clutch connection uh, this is a 3.0 engine so when the 3.0 engine came, of course, uh, automatic, uh, I'm sorry, this is not a 3.0, this is a 3.4. <laughs> uh, this is an automatic tra uh, automatic transmission engine. So what I had to do is uh, there's already that little cutout in there for the pilot bearing 
what I had to do is get a pilot bearing for either a 3.4 or a 3.0 and they both turn out to be the exact same part number uh, just go ahead and slap that in there using the correct size socket uh, to slam it on in and uh, all your other 3.0 clutch uh, components are going to be okay in it what I did with mine of course is I changed it as I did my cha uh, change my timing belt and did the valve adjustment so it's always good to do everything in my opinion before you put it in so that way it'll last you 100,000 miles and not have to worry about anything or hope it lasts you 100,000 miles. Now if you're using a 3.4 clutch you're going to use all the components from your 3.4 clutch uh, basically the flywheel on a 3.4 uh, is going to be <clears throat> a little bit larger a little thicker a little larger uh, some people say it's a little bit better but uh, the difference really isn't going to be that much unless you're doing some hardcore wheeling all the time. So all your components match up, or it can be used with exception of the throwout bearing. The throwout bearing you're going to have to use a 3.0 throwout bearing instead of the 3.4. Uh, the reason behind it, I guess, is uh, the distance between the shaft and you know uh, the flywheel is going to be a little bit different. So um, <clears throat> when it actually gets pushed up against your um, pressure plate I'm sorry it's not gonna be the right distance so anyway that's what you're gonna need when considering a clutch okay we talked about the battery now moving up over here what I want to address is your oil tube uh, your oil tube is gonna have to be moved to help uh, get it out of the way as before it was between your engine mounts so uh, go ahead and pick up the appropriate um, dipstick tube uh, you are gonna need the union down there at the bottom and of course uh, you could reuse this one uh, the other thing you're gonna have to do is take your old a hole and just plug up your old hole I just used a bolt I can't remember which one uh, bolted it and uh, Loctite it in and it was pretty good the other thing I want to keep in mind uh, and remind you uh, is that uh, uh, stepping back a little bit about your oil pan uh, you're going to need to pick up your oil uh, baffle for the inside. Yes, there's a modification uh, lesson out there on uh, Yoda Tech that you can, excuse me, get a hold of and tell you how to modify your old one. But I just went ahead and picked up a baffle from uh, uh, Off-Road Specialties and took it like that. Okay, now I'm going to move to the back of the engine. Back of the engine over here is going to have all of your attachments for your radiator hoses. This is a pretty common thing that uh, I got messed up, and that is uh, when you're mounting these things and putting the hoses in, I was able to use some hoses from my 3.0 and also some regular lines that connect down there to the rear heater. This one goes in the front, and where'd it go? I don't know. Over on this one here has a little ear that comes off here and comes down there and hooks to the other one. Um, you'll see this part right here comes from your 3.0. This part over here also comes from your 3.0 and they'll have the connectors for your rear heater. If you don't have a rear heater, then I guess don't worry about it. But hooking these things up, it's important to keep in mind that for the 97 engine, okay, on the back of your radiator hose on your engine, it's going to go passenger side to the inlet back here on your intake heater control then that's going to go into your firewall then your driver's side okay on your engine goes to driver's side on the engine goes to the passenger side on the inlet uh, I'm sorry this is part coming out this is going in this is coming out so that's important to keep that in mind it's a passenger I'm sorry passenger to driver's side driver's side on the engine to passenger on the firewall I think I said that right I hope it did anyway let's also move on to your adaption of your harness to the actual connection back in here notice this is kind of stretched a little bit Whereas before it wasn't, there was about this much of a gap in there, which is all right. What you want to do on your harness is take that tape off 
and this will actually stretch. So what I did is I stretched it to match it over here on this side. Uh, and then I used the front boot to kind of, I will, I haven't done this yet. As you can see, I'll explain this in a second. This will slide right back there and connect up to this. After I zip tie it, slap it into place, we're good. This is the grommet that comes off of your 3.0. You're going to need to take the grommet off of your 3.4 harness. Just take the end off, it comes off nice and easy with a pair of tin snips. Uh, and keep this boot, which is very easily cut. Careful small little cuts. And this is what you're gonna need to mount up to your 3.0. Okay, I think this pretty much covers everything. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is your upper radiator hose. Uh, there's some forums out there uh, or threads that say to use a certain hose. I unfortunately followed that advice and as a result, although it looked like there was plenty of distance between my top radiator hose and the fan, unfortunately under engine flex it made contact as you can, pardon me, as you can see and uh, damage them up radiator hose. So that part number that you're going to need to reference is 21534 which is in essence just a 3.4 upper radiator hose. Lower radiator hose is going to be uh, part number oh boy I can't see it. How about part number well I'll post it I can't remember what that is uh, but that's another important thing. Uh, I'm not sure if I covered it I think I did, never mind. Okay, so that pretty much concludes all the parts you're going to need to transfer over and so on and so forth. Uh, in the next segment, what I'm going to do is talk about the importance of cleaning your engine before you actually install it and the things to do that can keep your troubleshooting down to a minimum. So hang tight. Okay, so you've received your engine from a shipper or you got it from a yard and uh, you're getting it ready to do your swap thing to take into consideration is you have no idea how this other person that formerly owned the truck or engine took care of it. Uh, many times these engines will have, you know, 125, 130 by the time you get it. And uh, for all you know, you know, not to sound sexist or anything like that or politically incorrect, but I'm just going to state it the way it is because I'm just blunt like that, is it could have been a lady or a female owned your engine. All right. Well, we know that some women don't take care of their cars and it could be seven eight thousand miles before they change the oil or whatever they just don't take care of it uh, radiator fluid the same way so what i suggest you do when you first get your motor is to take off the throttle body of all the posts that i've read it's very common that the throttle body is going to be clogged up as mine was uh, and i'll talk about that in a second uh, and it's going to lead to rough idle, it's going to lead to all kinds of different problems, uh, poor gas mileage, poor fuel economy, poor power, poor everything. So I'm going to go ahead and take this apart here in a little bit and talk to you about how to clean it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to speak about while I'm here is as you do your conversion and after you're done, you might be using and you can use of course your 3.0 throttle body cable. Keep in mind that this bracket right here it's positioned more up and your your line is just not long enough so the only way to get it to properly operate is what I used is a uh, a bar right there and carefully or not carefully but just tap the heck out of it and bend this forward a little bit be careful don't break it the other option that other people have spoken about that's effective is to take a Dremel cut it down that little line right there that you see split it and then bend just this portion right here. Either way, just know this is gonna to have to be adjusted. So, let's go ahead and take apart the throttle body and I'll talk about uh, how to clean it out properly and uh, maybe I'll talk about how to do some testing to make sure it works, so hang tight. Okay, as you can see, I've disconnected the throttle body. It's a really simple process. It took me maybe three minutes of that. It's just uh, two bolts on top that are going to be 12 millimeter and two on the bottom. No big deal. Pop those out. You're also going to have, as you can see down there, uh, your radiator lines are going to go in, coolant lines. And at the very bottom, this is the one we want, we, we're going to talk about right now. I'm cleaning the throttle body, the bottom you have what's called your IAC 
or idle air control. This is very commonly clogged up and I read a great deal of posts from people who are saying that they have a rough idle or uh, poor gas mileage or just, you know, just bad air mixture and fuel mixture and it all comes down to that IAC. Basically you can see the port on the inside that drips down into that. I don't have it apart but to clean it what I recommend that you do is you'll see those four screws at the very bottom. They are on there tight kids. So what I recommend that you do is put your throttle body on a table, use all of your weight with the correct screwdriver tip, slap it in there and give it a good sharp twist and it'll set it loose. You'll notice on the inside uh, of, of this little IAC there are going to be two ports that are going to be probably could be very highly corroded up with a lot of corrosion uh, and just sediment left over. Um, most importantly what I want to talk about is that hose at the bottom. Let's see if I can get it in the light. I don't know. That hose at the bottom is going to be your air intake hose. If that for whatever reason gets clogged up your vehicle will not idle. How do I know? Well, it happened to me. I had it all fired up and I spent about, oh, maybe a day, a day and a half trying to track it down to find out why it would not stay running. I took it apart and originally I had bought this throttle body because my engine did not come with one from a junkyard and uh, well you get what you pay for I suppose but in the process I just cleaned it up well I didn't keep in mind that the IAC could be getting clogged so as I sprayed out the inside it dripped all the way down in the inside of that little turd and clogged it up because it was sitting for about a year and a half before I actually installed it in my engine so keep in mind that this tube right here using some throttle body cleaner scrub and clean the inside of that with a toothbrush and what I did is I just capped off sorry the light I apologize out. hose the bottom just cap it off fill it with throttle body cleaner let it sit for about oh, 20 minutes all right let it flow out this thing was so clogged up I could not blow through it it was more clogged up than an old man that needed prunes or something like that but it's going to be your IEC on the bottom. Important to clean this, I suggest it before you actually install your engine. Put it in. Uh, the second most common issue with these, especially with the Toyota uh, 3.4, from what I've been reading, is a throttle position sensor located at the back. Uh, I did pull a code on mine. I believe it was code uh, PO120. And uh, told me that that little sucker was bad, so I replaced it. No code. No big deal. Um, other thing to think about when installing all your plugs is don't use dielectric grease and I say that because uh, I did on my O2 sensors and it just wasn't reading it correctly so try to keep that in mind uh, when you're putting your plugs on is uh, maybe dielectric grease could be the problem if you do use it for a sensor not working now what I want to talk about is the gasket yes I had a throttle body gasket leak a vacuum leak check that out and you'll see here if you take this off this thing always needs to be replaced right afterwards no big deal what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a mod that I've been reading about I'm going to go something like this if you notice they have this little D ring almost like a D but look you know what that's a circle so what I'm going to do is uh, take a pair of tin snips and just uh, very carefully this is just a Felpro, no big deal. Uh, it's easier to use the Felpro than it is the metal one to trim it, I think, because if this thing gets slightly bent, it could give you a vacuum leak, whereas uh, a Felpro one will just kind of compress nicely. So what I'm going to do here is uh, trim it out a little bit and um, might give it a little bit more airflow. It seems like it's a restriction. People are saying it is. I don't know, just for shits and giggles, I'll go ahead and I'll do it. So hang tight. Okay, I have the new gasket there. Kind of rounded it off the best way I could. Got rid of that. Uh, is that even in the camera view? Yeah, it is. Uh, D-ring. The other thing I want to talk about once again is cleanliness. Uh, once again, you don't know where this engine came from or who owned it or the condition. Also, if you put your finger in here, kind of rev it out. That's pretty gross. Okay, I made the mistake of not doing this uh, when I had my um, uh, plenum off to go ahead and do my 
the valve adjustment. I didn't do this. So what I'm going to do is just use some sea foam. Now I know a lot of people are going to say, don't use sea foam, don't do this. And uh, even though I do agree with it, it does have the aggressive uh, chemicals in there that I need to actually clean out my air intake and also my valves. Uh, and just in a nutshell, you can do the same thing with diesel fuel. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit. It's an old uh, farmer trick that I learned. So anyway, I'm going to bolt it all back together and um, take it from there. I thought I would address something of importance. Once after you've cleaned it, there's a great possibility you could have debris that's stuck in the butterfly shaft that goes across and uh, elsewhere. So I strongly recommend that you just uh, take some PB blaster and just blast those areas right up in there by the butterfly on either end and uh, keep that nice and clean, clean it out. So keep that in mind. Another thing I'd like to address with regard to cleaning is gonna be your mass airflow sensor. Uh, this is another common area that uh, people have problems with because uh, the engine uh, won't idle right. It's just having a hard time starting or anything like that. And it could be a direct result of uh, two little electrodes that come down uh, that get dirty, especially if you're using a K&M air, air filter or something of the sort. It gets caked up. It's going to need to have regular cleaning. And uh, I suggest in the future... Uh, that you simply keep it clean and clean it down during your oil change. And what I use is quite simply just a CRC mass airflow sensor. Uh, just squirt it down really good about 10, 15 times, let it air dry really well and put it back in and this could very easily solve your problems. Uh, this is also really good for cleaning out your uh, plugs and connectors and everything like that, especially if it's been sitting for a while as this has. So keep that in mind. Clean your airflow, mass airflow sensor before installing your engine could save you a great deal of time and troubleshooting in the end. Okay, as you saw by all the beautiful smoke, I uh, sea foamed it just by you know sucking it in through the brake booster. No big deal. Choking it out, letting it sit for a good 10 minutes. Now, a lot of people don't like sea foam. And the reason why they say, oh, my car runs shitty after I do it. Well, the reason why is chances are they did it when the spark plugs were crap anyway. And then they introduced all that stuff to it, which loosened up, of course, uh, all the carbon. And now they have fouled plugs. So the next step here is to uh, pull off all the coils and plugs and just give them a good clean and slap them back in. Problem solved. Runs a lot better. Uh, a lot more power and pickup and uh, all together. It's a good little way to make sure your engine stays clean. Okay, once again, since you have no idea who owned your engine previous, uh, there's a suggestion that I have that could very well clean out your internals of your engine and cause it to run a lot better. <clears throat> better compression, so on and so forth. Uh, and that is, on your first startup, chances are when it was shipped, it did not come with any oil in it, which is cool. Just slap on an oil filter, a cheap O1, uh, put some cheap oil in there, five quarts, and add one quart of ATF to it. Okay. If the engine is very old, and I learned this trick from an old farm boy buddy of mine who used to take old vehicles out <clears throat> that had been sitting out in the field forever. Anyway, he would go 50-50 with ATF and actual diesel fuel, which ironically enough from what I read is just what seafoam is, is just diesel fuel. And he would run it, clean it out, then he would dump it. And uh, when I did it this engine, uh, I put in new oil, let it run for five minutes. That oil came out, and it was as black as I had ever seen it. It was just disgusting. So, after you do that, of course, just drain the oil, you know, drain it out. Um, change your oil filter and fill it up with good quality oil, a good filter. Uh, and then what I did is I added uh, just a... Oh, about a half a quart of um, Mar Marvel Mystery Oil to it to help further clean things out, lubricate everything, lubricate the valves, lubricate everything. Once again, this has been sitting for about a year and a half. 
uh, prior to me putting it in uh, in my yard here so I want to make sure it's it's really clean anyway that concludes a good portion of what is needed to do your 3.4 swap uh, I've driven it of course runs awesome lots of power nice and smooth um, other than that I'm very happy with uh, my decision to do this swap I know these engines will run absolutely forever if well maintained I've seen some run as far as you know 400 500,000 miles on up depends on how you, well you take care of it and little things you do so once again important features that I suggest people do before they install their engine is clean the throttle body possibly just replace your uh, throttle position sensor because they commonly go out anyway um, clean your mass airflow sensor make sure after you clean out your throttle body that you vent your hose here okay and uh, prior to starting your engine and running it just uh, you know run some ATF in it with five quarts of oil and call it good and it should keep it clean and most importantly this little preventative maintenance before you put it in is going to save yourself a lot of codes. Um, of course, I didn't have that many. One code I got was a throttle position sensor, but most importantly with my engine and the frustration I had is it simply would not idle at all. It was starving for air. And my mixture got mixed up in the whole nine yards. So for those people out there that do decide just to suck it in and clean it that way, keep in mind that little tube at the bottom at the bottom over here could get clogged up and if that does you have choked it it's not going to go anywhere uh, other thing to keep in mind when you're looking over your harness are your connectors okay look for wires that might be uh, compromised I had a wire as you can see right back here that had a split in the bottom of it and I believe it was causing an arc and a misfire so that corrected that problem uh, check out your connectors another common thing right down here on your um, on your igniter is some of these wires might not have a good connection at the at the plug there that could really screw things up for you um, in the case of doing troubleshooting like I did I probed a lot of the wires to do my troubleshooting so I need to go through find those little holes I know I shouldn't have probed it but I did only because I'm gonna use some liquid tape and just fill up those little holes uh, it's important you don't want to get any corrosion in there so anytime you probe anything inside the engine just go ahead and put a little dab of that liquid tape on it and that should be good to go um, other than that I think I've covered everything I hope you've enjoyed these videos I hope it has given you a little bit of a heads up on the things you're going to need to consider when doing your swap the things you're going to need from your 3.0 over to your 3.4 the evap how to hook up your evap which is common uh, let's get back to the battery once again sorry about that one of the very common causes for a bad connection to your ground is going to be I ran a thicker wire from a negative to my body back here a little wire that they have off of battery cables is just too small so I ran a bigger one uh, I want to also talk about a very important ground point for you is when you light I'm sorry maybe it's picking it up I don't know this is from your old harness this ground is your most important thing right here and it's going to ground up to your block because this is the ground for your IGF and all your ignition wires and everything like that and if you don't have a good enough ground you're not going to get spark and it's just not going to go anywhere uh, wiring I think the grounds were eh, not that big of an issue um, you also have some ground wires up in there that hook up to your diagnostics um, another option that people do and I might think about this if I have bad charging issues with my battery is I use the old harness and the old connection but the wire goes all the way across there to the box and then it goes all the way back over here so if I'm having a hard time charging I'm just going to do a direct link with a fuse 120 amp I don't know whatever 160 whatever between my alternator directly to my battery make sure you fuse it everything gets fuses fused up you don't want to have any fires that would ruin your day and uh, um, need I say more anyway if you've enjoyed this video just uh, go ahead and comment and uh, if you thought it was a piece of shit just go ahead and comment too if there's things that I missed 
go ahead and let me know or most importantly let other people know uh, I'm just doing this whole video on a whim no notes or anything like that and sometimes uh, I, I forget stuff so let's all make this a big giant group effort everybody can help out everybody and make this a success that's what it's all about not only that but karma is a good thing one other thing I want to talk about is lubricating your throttle I know we talked about the inside it just kind of slipped my mind as I'm thinking about it here but uh, lube the heck out of these springs your connectors uh, your connection to your throttle body and just makes everything nice and smooth if you want to you can go ahead and lube up your cable just go ahead and put it up in the air slap some oil in it anyway take it easy have a good day and if you do swap have fun that's what it's all about take it easy peace